Welcome to the Upholstery Show, live from Arlington, Massachusetts. We're going to serve you up a beautiful bowl of coconut fiber. Really? Go ahead. Well, welcome to another question and answer. I literally just sat down. It's been so busy. We've, you know, it's been a whirlwind. I'm blessed that it's busy. I'm so glad, especially in August. And I, it's a good sign. I think the economy is opening up, at least here in Massachusetts. And I hope that to my friends out there in the whole world, I hope you guys are doing as well. Or, or it looks like it's turning around for you. We, we hope that uh, our friends on the West Coast uh, see that happening soon, uh, uh, a settling down of things, so to speak. So um, we're grateful for the work. Um, I, before I start on my questions uh, or comments that we have, I just wanted to mention last week I featured this chair, and I think Janine had a question which we're going to get to about this chair. Um, I do want to speak of, uh, professionally speaking, about how um, I give estimates before all my jobs. I mean, you cannot say to a customer, you know, I'm going to have to get back to you with the price or can you give me a deposit without knowing the final number. So you have, uh, if you're doing this professionally, you have to present a, a, a proposal or an estimate for the job. And that has to be proper. You have to, that's it. Once you make an estimate, that's it. You know, you're, you're estimating the labor and the yardage usually, those two key component, components. On this job, I estimated um, one other thing, and that's the refinishing, um, I actually presented it as a deep clean. The customer wanted a deep clean, but what happened, so I, I gave an estimate for this job, and um, it turns out that it needed much more. I had to hire a professional woodworker uh, in order to really get this looking good. I mean, the, the chairs needed, all of them needed to be re-glued, and um, they needed more than a cleaning. Yes, they got a cleaning, but beyond that, there were some areas, like in the back especially, this is a little tricky, you guys. You know, this was opening up on the back. There was um, this, this bent wood sometimes opens with the things that are aged, especially things that had got a little weather or moisture. So he, he did an excellent job. I just want you guys to really see the job that this refinisher did. And this is before I'm, I'm a pulse man. It cost, it cost me, so, the, so what I'm trying to get at is it cost me more, much more. Um, to have him do that than what I estimated. I am not going to call the client and tell him that, though. That's That was my job to estimate it, right? So once in a while, you have to take a hit, is what I'm saying. You have to keep you know keep the integrity of, of, of uh, the business going, you know. Um, the worst thing is to call a customer and say, you know, it was more than what I thought it was. I don't do that, and I don't think you should either. Just kind of bite the bullet and learn your lesson, probably and ask your woodworker before you est estimate. Maybe that's a way to do it, I don't know. But I just wanted to just bring this up a little closer to the camera to see how beautiful these nice Scandinavian design chairs came out. And then I'm gonna show you the fabric that's been picked for this. It's kind of cool, the different, little different color. I call it aqua, but um, I'm gonna ask Michaela what color she thinks that is. What do you think, aqua? Teal. Teal, yeah, it's probably better. I'm gonna bring that over to show you guys. So, <clears throat> it's not what I would have picked for the mid-century, but I think it's going to go cool. What do you guys think? So, <clears throat> if I, last week we had so many questions that I couldn't get to much of the work. Um, I'm going to try to get to a little bit of this. Uh, that's why I said last week, uh, but um, just to see if I can get to that and show you how sparsely padded these chairs are and, and explain to you why that is. I'm just going to put this over here for now. And then let's get to our questions and answers. If we have any live questions and answers right now? Questions, I mean. <laughs> I guess I give the answers. <laughs> Do we have any questions right now, Michaela? Okay, so let's just get right to these uh, comments. This is a comment from Brad. Uh, <laughs> who's Janine first, though? Janine? Yeah, it's on the top. It should be on top of the page. I had an order. Okay, and it's Brad second. Yeah, I do the YouTube stuff. Ours. So, uh, Ginny. Ginny, uh, she has a comment. and she you have a lot of good comments. What's that? She left a, a few good comments for us. Yeah, this is good. This will keep me talking for a while. Um, this is what happened last week. We started getting into some of the, these questions, and they're really in-depth questions. Um, she's very intuitive, so let's get with this one. And do you have a picture of that up there, Patrick? Yeah. Okay. 
I would love to know when this sofa set was manufactured. I broke down the inside back. It is laid with the springs, burlap, horsehair, K-pot cotton, and then the fabric. Wow. They got everything loaded in this sofa. Uh, and she goes on, I don't know if the horsehair can be salvaged. There is no mold, but it's really dusty. I'll just stop here and just let you know that um, you can get a pillowcase, put the, the horsehair in a pillowcase, and, and wash it. People have had great success with that. The only thing that would hamper you is if that pillow, pillowcase opened up. Make sure that you zip it close and maybe even put a stitch on it so that it doesn't open. And then uh, once it's done, uh, I think people do a light wash and, and it, it's, it's enough, it cleans the horse hair. And then all you have to do is pick the horse hair and you got, it's like buying it new. So that's what I would advise you to do. Um, the muslin envelopes encasing the K-Pak has disintegrated, so you can't do anything there. I was thinking about replacing it with rubberized horse hair, which is fine. 50-50 goose down or K-Pak and another layer of cotton, question mark. Is that correct? I'm a novice, hobbyist, and I have been taking classes for about one and a half years. I lost my mentor when the school closed. Also, the deck is a layer of cotton over the burlap, then the deck cloth. I was considering a layer of rubberized hair over the springs and then cotton. Is that too much? It's always advisable to use, the, there's only, for me, there's two choices um, for going over springs, no matter where the springs are. Um, Her project is up now. I have two pictures of the couch. Okay. So when you go over springs, especially in seats, you definitely need either horse hair, real horse hair, or rubberized horse hair. Guess what? I like the rubberized horse hair better in this case. Um, it takes the, the even it, if you do a good eight-way tie on the springs, the rubberized horse hair is a really good way of balance. And then you put the, you know, you got the springs, you got the, the spring twine, and then you spread the burl burlap tightly over that. Then over that, you put your rubberized horse hair. It tends to, to level off what imperfections are left in the, in the uh, spring. So if there's a spring sticking up just a teeny bit or tilted a little bit, the rubberized horse hair takes care of that. The burlap helps, but then the rubberized horse hair is the final thing. And then you definitely have to put over that cotton. So that would be, um, on this one here, that would be the deck area. The, the deck area would have that. And then your seat, you know, because remember they're separate. We have a question already. Let's just... This is from John. John. I'm glad. Is it the same John that we know? Yes. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you called because I got lost. John. Hi, John. I texted a pic of texted. some wingback arms to Kevin. They are unique. I get how the cut is curved, but I am unclear on how the allowance was made for the sewing or hand stitching. What is your take? You know, John, I, I have at least four different ways of communicating, and I couldn't remember how I did see that. And I couldn't remember how you communicated with me, and we were going to use this, and I'm so glad you contacted us. So now I know that you texted. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can find the text. Uh, what is the last three digits of his phone number? Don't say that. No, we that. won't say. <laughs> we won't say his whole phone no, no, number. No, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. So I got a picture of that, John, and. Um, He's asking, can you read can you read the question again, Eddie? Well, I got it right here. I see how a curved cut on the inside arm fabric would be required. But I'm uncertain on how an allowance was made for the blind stitching. You know, John, I don't think that's blind stitched. I think the top of that arm is machine stitched. Now that's not to say, I mean you could blind stitch it. And if you're more comfortable with blind stitching, you can do that. Um, but there's probably three ways you could do an arm like this. One would be to, to panel the top, and that's a half inch, it would be a half of an inch bigger than what I'm looking at. And then um, sewing the inside arm onto that, and that would be a half an inch allowance too. And then putting it on, you'd reverse the fabric, and then, and then kind of uh, fit it on. And that's how you do it. That's one way. Another way that sometimes novices find this easier is they'll post to the top of the arm first and staple all around, okay? And then the next, the inside arm can be blind tacked on that. That's another way. The only way that would work is if there's not much padding. If there's a lot of padding in there, it won't work that way. 
Um, so I hope that answers your questions. Um, and then he says, I think it might make a live topic, a live show topic, which it does. It does that nicely. It's hard to uh, it's hard to explain this uh, with just the picture, especially. Um, I hope that I hope that does well for John. But anyhow, do we have another question? Uh, he says the inside arm is one piece of fabric. The inside arm is one piece of fabric, meaning um, it's not stitched to the top of the arm. I wish I had pictures of the lot actually is this John calling me now <laughs> I'm gonna answer this because I think this might be John <laughs> hello <laughs> that was the wrong number <laughs> I, I, I thought it was John, John call us yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually I'm gonna call John let's call John let's see if he answers that would be easier sometimes you put just... him on the spot like that huh you put him on the spot like that let's call it looked the same phone number. It looked like the same number. Uh, hopefully John picks up. Hey John, I'm live and I wanted to call you. Is that okay? <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Put on speaker. <laughs> So you can so you can copy it just like it is. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But my concern is that I don't get how there's seam allowance for stitching that front seam that you take. You always you mean you know hand stitching allowance? Yeah, because the, the, it's not a raw edge on that on that front seam. That's that right. It can't be a raw edge. So you should you should do the same half inch allowance on a hand stitch. Is that? That answer your question. You pin it first. Make sure it's pinned tight. One of the keys to hand stitching is to make sure that it's pinned really tight. So be very generous with your pins. And then you take the pins out as you're hand stitching. Because I know that you're a good hand stitcher. So you can actually you can actually make that look like a machine stitch that you can be so good at your stitching, right? So so for a beginner that might be an easy way. That's a very difficult arm as you're finding out, right? Yeah. yeah. Anytime curves, anytime you introduce curves in upholstery, it's difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why all the furniture that you see today is all square, you know. So, it's easier to upholster squares than it is inside curves and, and roundabouts, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, I hope that answers your question. It does, it helps, I appreciate it. And thank you for, thank you for being part of the live show. Of course, of course. Okay, maybe we, we can do this more often. Thanks a lot, John. Absolutely, okay. thank you. Yep, you're welcome, bye. Well, that's a new segment to the show that we, we maybe we can introduce and call call customers or if they're willing to get on and maybe maybe what we can do is see how a sales call uh, sounds like or my sales call sounds like with a customer who maybe an older customer who's familiar with me and what I do here we can share that um, because I know people have a lot of questions about presenting themselves and, and um, uh, quotes on estimates and, and um, all that stuff. Um, usually that's done if it's a first time customer on the first call um, you have to make a good impression like you have to sound like you know what you're talking about I guess first of all um, but it's always good to have somebody talk to you about how to do that and if you especially if you're just starting like uh, Jenny is, is a year and a half um, she's calling herself a novice hobbyist now but I bet at one point <coughs> she may like some of our students want to uh, poster for their friends or family at first and maybe get paid and then and then move on into a career it, it, even if it's just going to be a supplemental career people have done that you know and I, I, I have confidence in my students I really do excuse me for a second <coughs> that is um, that's a cough from an upholstery shop from the dust in an upholstery shop you, so I think on uh, Ginny's I'm just going to go back and read a little bit more because I think I missed something she's uh, I broke down the inside back. She's got all that. We were, I was talking about the seat. 
You're now going to talk about the inside back on hers. That's a very unusual back that she has. That must be a, such a comfortable sofa that, I mean, when it was new. Um, so she should, <coughs> she should put the springs back on the back. Uh, the back springs are going to be uh, a lighter gauge spring. So you don't need to eight-way tie back springs. You can four-way tie back springs. And you use a nylon tufting twine to do that, not the heavy twine that you use on the seats, the, the ruby twine. Then she's going to burlap it. That's for sure. Then she could take that reused horse hair if she wants. I don't advise you to use the rubberized horse hair in the back. I don't think that's a good idea because the back is much softer than the seat. So a replacement for the, the whole real horse hair I think I would use on the back. And then the K-Pock, I'm not sure is reusable, but that would be kind of cool to reuse the K-Pock. And then, and then probably before the cotton goes on, muslin, muslin over the K-Pock. Um, she doesn't have to build a pocket for the K-Pock. She can just go right over it. She can have the sofa laying down on its back, put the K-Pock in, and then go over that with muslin and, and secure the muslin with staples. And then the cotton goes on loose, and then the fabric. Okay? So I hope that answers all your questions. That's a load of those. Are, that, is, that is a very comfortable sofa. Springs everywhere on this sofa, you guys. So let's just put that aside for now. And then we have one... Um, from Brad, a comment from Brad King. Um, he says, there's a picture up there, I think Patrick's going to get that. Or, okay. yeah, I it. He says, hi, I have a question on this chair. I'm pretty sure it's an American Empire style, and I agree with that. I think late 1800s, and I agree with that. This will be the first attempt on my own. I know that the spring's edge needs retied, but does it need an eight-way or redone the same way? So, Brad, it's good to see, when you have this chair, you guys can see the spring work on this chair. It's good to see that the original spring work is still there. And I don't know if John, I mean, I don't know if Brad did these tie. I see he's got, or oh, maybe it was there before. Um, but this has connected to it a wire on the bottom. The springs are attached to uh, the wire, that big heavy wire. And... Uh, Brad, I think you should keep that. Okay, what I would do, the very first thing I would do, you might be surprised, you guys, the very first thing I would do is take a ball of cotton, like a fist-sized ball of cotton, and stick it in between the bottom rung, which is the smallest rung on these springs, and that wire edge, so that, and do that on every spring. So that's, that's going to eliminate any noise that might result in people sitting on this. That's the very first thing you want to do. It looks like they might have removed it, somebody removed it. And then, no, you do not have to eight-way tie this. That's the main question he's asking. I think a four-way tie would be more than sufficient. Sometimes what I do is I take out the, they have these little metal clips that we're attaching. <clears throat> if they're rattling or making a lot of noise after, what you want to do is you want to, where the pair of pliers, tighten them all first. And to see how they're performing. Uh, the ones along the edge, um, the hog clips they're called along the edge, definitely you need to keep those, but make sure that they're tight. The little wires, some of them might already be missing. You might want to um, you know, take a pair of pliers, see how well they do it re-gripping, re re-tightening. Re Sometimes they're rusted and they'll snap, get rid of them if they do that. And go with your, your ruby twine. Your ruby twine is designed so that it's non-squeak. Does that sound funny, you guys? Um, some twines, like the nylon twine, squeaks. Nylon that's replaced with the burlap squeaks. And the nice thing about burlap and the ruby twine, it's all jute, the ruby twine, uh, it doesn't squeak. The ruby twine has an added bonus to it as a jute twine, first of all, but it has a wax, like a wax coating that actually prevents, after you tie it, it doesn't squeak and it doesn't slip. <coughs> so, if, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's a time-tested, time-tested uh, material specifically for what you're using, Brad. So I hope that was a help. And then, um, he doesn't have any other follow-up questions, but Brad, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, you guys, cotton dust in the air here, a lot of dust. Um, so, 
Patrick might want to get me a glass of water downstairs. Uh, the water, okay. I mean. <laughs> okay, <laughs> down there. <laughs> On the shelf down there, there's some. There's some bottled water. Yeah, yeah. If you go beyond the refrigerator. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go to the next question. <clears throat> we have been uh, straight out today. Like I said before we uh, before we started, I had just sat down and uh, so. Did you find it, Pat? Find it? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Live TV, you guys. Sorry. Okay. So now we're going to get to the YouTube questions, right, Patrick? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we have a live question, though. I have a question. This is from Daniel. Hi, Daniel. I have a question. It is, is it possible to save furniture that's been infested by rats, rat pee, rat poop, or is it lost? Asking for a guy who built a house with rats. Bought, I Bought a house with rats. Yeah. Well, I, I can't, fortunately, I've never had that problem in, in over 40 years. I've had mouse, little mouse infestation, but I've not had the rat problem. Um, but we've had cat problems, so cat urine. And I can tell you that that is a tough one. Um, the only chance that you have of, of helping out, you'd have to strip the furniture down to the frame for sure, get rid of all of the organic materials and even the synthetics and go down to the frame um, and then have it ozoned. Uh, this is a treatment. Don't ask me how it works. Uh, even people who are in that business when you say, hey, how does your ozone machine work? Uh, they don't know, which is a little scary. but. It's supposed to, now the reason I know that this might work, this might work, it's worth a try. It might even be worth a try before you take all of the material off. I mean, the top materials sound like they have to come off, but the ozoning actually takes out fire smell. I know that. And, and I'll just go tell you, basically, uh, it's a machine that they, they usually, they do it in a trailer, a, tr a truck trailer. They have it and they have it worked into it into the, they have the ozone whatever it is pumped into the trailer and then the treatment lasts I think 24 hours or something like that um, they, they disconnect it and I think they give it a little time and then they believe it or not it's like it, it is really it works um, not sure about urine I've never tried it on that or rat infestation but I bet it's worth a try uh, you might want to check that out Google that Google, Google ozone treatment for, first try out ozone treatment for fire, uh, fire damage, smoke damage, smoke damage, and then see what comes up. And that's the only advice I can give you. And then the other thing would be the old fashioned way was to just take it all the way down to the frame <coughs> and then refinish the wood. And, and that's, how, that's how you could do it. It's the old fashioned way. And um, mm -hmm. good luck with that one. That's a tough one. Um, so Janine says, this is about vintage Scandinavian dining room chair deconstruction, which was last week. And now now I'm, I'm glad we could see a progression on this. From last week we had them come in and they've been refinished and re-glued. Isn't that beautiful? Like I showed you. Janine says, it would be interesting to see the difference between the backs with and without the half layer of cotton under the fabric. Well, there you go. There, there's the plane. There's the wood. And um, I am going to probably replace it with uh, this Dacron I wanted to show you. And um, hardly any at all. Um, and the next question we have is the upholstery show live from last week. Do you use spring down cushions on top of an eight way tied springs? Or is the spring down cushion an alternative to the eight way tied spring? I think both. I think when you have a seat cushion, actually, um, these cushions that were on Ginny's sofa, I can guarantee they were probably uh, a Marshall unit wrapped with cotton. 
So she had springs in the seat, and she had springs on the on the she had springs in the cushion, and she had big number four or five springs in the seat. And I think she got she got the best seating. And I think that certainly you can go spring and down cushion. Um, when I'm trying to, I don't try to sell spring and down cushions over over spring seat cushions because I think. Another way of looking at it too is, uh, yeah, sure, you get a, you get springs everywhere at that point, but um, if you do a foam cushion, um, they tend to work together so that you get a really good seat too with the, with the foam cushion. So you can do either way. Uh, I suppose it depends on how much your client, in the in the case of a professional, how much is your client willing to willing to pay for that. Um, but anyhow. So then we go to sewing machine basics. I think I did like a basic sewing machine um, maintenance or something, and they said nice work on that. I appreciate the compliments, especially from another professional. Uh, he does upholstery on cars, I believe. And car upholstery, as I mentioned before, is a little bit, uh, a little bit different than what we do. Uh, different tools, different setup. Uh, people ask me all the time, can you do my car? I say, I can't, so I don't have the setup. I mean, I can, but I just don't have, I'm not set up. So what I mean by that is I have a storefront, a walk-in storefront. Um, when you do automobile work, you need a, you need at least one bay garage. You're, you're almost like a mechanic in some ways. And you need the space of a mechanic. You need to, you know, sp spread out. Um, it's more space and, and finding a bay in a commercial area sometimes can be a little tricky. Um, usually two bay um, is what you want because you want to be uh, working probably on two jobs at once. Uh, it's much different th than my setup. Um, so it's a little bit more costly too to set up than you can imagine. Um, Kevin Eaton. Um, oh, uh, Kevin says we're talking about the vintage Scandinavian and I'm glad, he, I'm, glad I'm, I'm talking about this. He, I was talking about Scandinavia and I left out, I was talking about the countries and I left out Sweden. How can I leave out Sweden? I had a, a Swedish intern one summer here, uh, Gisla was her name, if she's watching. Hello, hello. She came um, on a visa for six months and she was a professional upholsterer from Sweden. Wasn't I lucky guys to have a professional upholsterer from Sweden who came and, and uh, did work with me. She was really good too. They actually are one of the few countries that have um, she had a bachelor's in, in upholstery. Can you believe that? She did, and, and she was a, a real scholar when it came to upholstery. And, and I learned from her. I'll tell you. I learned from all my students, but Gisela was special, and I miss her. Um, so hello to Gisela. And how could I forget Sweden? I can't believe that. <laughs> Sorry, Sweden. <laughs> um, so then we have another uh, question. This is from. How to upholster an 1860s chair part for stuffing the seat. And there's that thumbnail again with the saloon in the background. Oh yeah, that was, that was <laughs> did we get a lot of, uh, that was fun, wasn't it Patrick? We got yeah, a lot of, cool. lot of results from that, did we? Mm -hmm. The question that L. Russell has is, is chenille a good fabric to upholster a sofa? Absolutely, I think chenille, um, a chenille was uh, made uh, as a replacement to velvet, and the thing about chenilles is, is it doesn't have the heavy napping that a velvet has, and naps uh, can be tricky to work. Um, a high nap sometimes, all the time, in a velvet will, will show marks. I have some here that I can show you that uh, a velvet, some mark more than others, but when you're selling a velvet, you say to the customer, Velvets are great. I said, but remember, there's going to be marking, even roll marks, even coming off the roll. They're called roll marks. So you have to present it like that. Think about chenilles. They don't have much of that uh, with the roll marks, um, the way that it's manufactured. It's almost like it's a soft, if it's velvet-like, but without the roll marks. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so I think it was designed for that reason. Um, and chenilles, yeah, no, chenilles are beautiful. I like chenilles. Some chenilles you have to be real careful with, though. Like every other fiber fabric, some are better than others, and some chenilles really fray. You should be aware of any fabric that frays a lot at the end. Um, ideally, you don't want to have to surge. People say, well, just surge the fabric. Mm. 
ideally you don't want a fabric that even has to be surged because even after you surge it you still have to put a seam in it and I've seen it fail at the seam some fibers so be careful with your with what you pick for upholstering any any fabric really that, that's just common sense right um, so then we have Janine again thank you Janine for being such a good support isn't she Patrick yeah Janine? Very, right from the very so. beginning yeah. and um, you know I, I, I want to stop here and talk about the um, the YouTube channel Patrick well Broadway close close, uh, close to a thousand how many are we 10,000 excuse me how many are we from 10,000 do you have the statistic we're almost at nine uh, 990 yeah 9,900 and almost at 9,900 9, so we're about a hundred away yeah. so I guess it would be a good time to remind people to subscribe I mean we could be 10,000 this week or next week early if if we can get people to subscribe and, and we appreciate it if you've already done that but if you're watching this for the first time and you're learning something um, even if you think I'm a little goofy give me a give me a sus <laughs> subscribe if you think you know we don't mind we we could take with thick skin here right Patrick yeah we've had trolls before so. sure you know a troll what's a troll <laughs> right um, so we're going to go on to the next basic fabric cuts. I like doing this. This was a YouTube uh, one that I did where I showed people fabric cutting when I was teaching. I've taught many, many people, thousands of people in the Boston area in adult ed situations usually, and some not. But um, I remember that the hardest thing or the most anxiety-filled thing is cutting fabric around, around posts, you know because people put, at that point, it put a lot of work into it. I think that's part of the anxiety and they don't want to make a mistake. And the other reason, cutting uh, in upholstery is so counterintuitive to, I think, almost anything that you've probably ever done. Um, and, the, and the only way I can describe it is it's like working in a mirror. Um, if you're a weatherman, uh, the old-fashioned weatherman, Patrick, I'm not sure if you're familiar, if you know this, when they're looking at that screen, they've, they've actually had to learn how to think backwards. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, reverse, yeah. So behind, they, they had to work in reverse. Not as easy as you think it is. And that's what makes cutting difficult. And in this video, I tried to explain it. Um, and I think I did an okay job. But let's see what, let's see what uh, Emily says about this. And she's one of our yearly, she got our master, uh, certificate. Oh, she did, Patrick. Yeah. Do you want to remind people what that is? So if you get the yearly subscription, after a little bit, once you've done the classes, we'll send you a master. Is that automatic? No, I, I mean, they can request it if they've said they've done all. There's no way of, there's no way really of us knowing that they completed the classes, but... They need no. to let us know that they've completed yeah, it. So yeah, John them. should pay attention, because John, John just recently bought a subscription, and we should bring that up now. Yep. At BroadwayUpholsterySchool.com, right, Patrick? Yep. Where they can where they can get on and just look over the website. It doesn't cost anything to get on there to see what we're doing, but we're offering supplies and cush custom cushions. And I think we've made it really easy on the custom cushions and, and all supplies. But we're we're trying to find easier ways for people to order materials because that we find is a very difficult thing for people because. Um, it, it's really just a whole different culture, isn't it, Patrick? Yeah, it is. Um, so we think we found easy ways of ordering. Uh, so you should check that out. Um, but uh, let's just go to this. So let's see what she says. She says, thanks, Kevin. This is a really great tutorial topic. I love when you point out and explain to us some of the many fiddly sort of details, issues that come up for people who may just be getting into the craft. Yeah, and I, I think, thank you for the compliment, I think that's just because I've taught so many people with so many different learning um, styles and, uh, to be honest, learning styles and also um, learning disabilities. I'll just say, I, I worked in a shop, I think I mentioned this last week, um, for four years with people with major learning disabilities and I think that what that, what that made me was just a better teacher. So you should, if you're wondering what that means, you need to go on and look at the online classes to see what I mean by that. Um, but I will say this, that when you're teaching people who have disabilities, you have to break down the steps um, so um, a much, much greater a breakdown of the steps. And then you have to adjust, when you have a room full of people, you have to adjust to each person's um, 
you know, level of learning. Yeah. And, uh, and everybody can learn. I think it also uh, oftentimes depends on the teacher, what type of teacher you have. Um, anybody can learn if the teacher is able to teach. Does that make sense? I'm sure it does to people who taught. But I, I will mention one, one, I won't mention a name, but this was really interesting where um, it, 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 there was a learning disability where things were learned kind of, it, it wasn't dyslexia, it was something even more great, greater than that. It was almost like a physical uh, thing. And so that was interesting teaching somebody like that. I mean, I, I really, really almost have to get into the head of the person who was having the, you know, who's having the difficulties, but I think I did a pretty good job. So I think that, you know, when I explain things like cutting, it's really difficult, especially on a one-dimensional screen. I mean, we're still one-dimensional, right, Patrick? We're not three-dimensional, right, Patrick? Unless you want one of those glasses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe someday we can teach on online and three-dimensional, right? I don't think we can do it right now, <laughs> right? We are, I mean, virtual reality or something. Well, virtual reality is how far away are we from that? Who knows? It's already out there, but I don't know how the heck I'm going to make a YouTube video. So the point <laughs> is... Upholstery. Right. But the point is, when I'm doing the YouTube videos or, or when we're doing the online classes, there has to be a lot of verbalage, right? And and I think one, one time somebody said, Oh, you talk too much. And that was from somebody who was a, a professional upholster, of course. Of course, I talk too much if, you, if you're a professional upholster and you're watching my YouTube videos, right, Patrick? Yes. You, uh, check your check your email, Dad. You're and gonna ill from, and ill from last week. You're gonna think I talk too much, and if you think I talk too much, or if you're learning, if you're a visual learner, just turn the volume down. <laughs> and Michaela just dropped her phone. Hold on a second. I'm gonna go pick it up. I'm gonna be a gentleman. Thank you. You're welcome. Because <laughs> it would have required her to. You know, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes that you guys don't see, and one of them is that Michaela does a great job on on that camera. So yeah, I forwarded you an email question from uh, ML from, from India. From India? Pretty sure. So he wants to know, pretty much the broad question, but he'd like to know what the best cushioning would be for that. Well, what do you recommend? He starts talking about pretty much nothing. This is a nil from last week, yes. right? I can't get the picture up because it's a long Well, I'm going to get the picture up and show people up here. There's the picture. So he's and asking. And he has a sofa, too. It's the same style, though, right? Yeah. So he's asking what the best cushioning is for that. Well, you've got a problem because there are no springs. You have slats in that, right? So, uh, for comfort reasons, I would think the spring and down cushion on the back, on the seat, if you have an unlimited budget, right? And now, if you have an unlimited budget, you need to do spring down cushions on the seat, and on the back cushions, I recommend a 50-50 down fill. And, and, and you also have another problem of, I, I can't, I can guess that the dimensions on this, but I'm guessing that um, on the seat cushion, you should be okay with the four inch cushion. Because keep in mind, if you do a spring and down cushion, you can't do anything less than four inches, okay? Um, and on the back cushion, you have to keep it to a three inch cushion on the back. You can still do a 50-50 down fill. That's the best. I just gave you the best cushioning. So let's say you're on a budget, then you could go to, um, I guess the next best thing or the middle would be foam and Dacron, a good polyurethane. And you know, you can go on our website, Broadway Upholstery, because BroadwayPolsterySchool.com. I'll tell you because with my over 40 years experience I'm only offering one grade of foam on that. It's a high density ultra medium density foam medium firm foam and it's not it's intended universally. I very rarely have somebody say I want extra firm that's hardly ever happens. Um, and then the other way to do it so on the seat cushion you do a four inch foam and Dacron seat cushion on the back, you could do a, a three-inch soft foam and Dacron cushion. So that's a little bit less less pricey than the other ones I mentioned. And then the worst cushion you can put on this, the worst filling, and I just had some cushions that came in the shop. I just couldn't believe what they did. They layered bonded Dacron. Let me show you. You saw the other picture that he sent too, right? Not yet. They laid, like on fifth seat cushions, they just took bonded Dacron. They took all this Dacron. They stuffed it with just Dacron. It was the worst 
failing cushion that I've ever I've ever seen. And the reason they did it, they were like cushion, you know, order order cushions, you know, being made. I won't do that yet. I won't I won't take an order over the over the website making making cushions, for, you know, making the cover and the filling. She dropped it again. You believe it, you guys? I'll get it. <laughs> She's got the dropsies today. <laughs> All right. Take that other photo that you sent. All right. Well, it's just the it's just the the sofa. Oh, is that okay? I have to say though, it's kind of neat. I mean, I'll, I'll show people the sofa all the way from India. What province in India? We'd like to know. And do you have elephants in the neighborhood? <laughs> that would be cool. Can you let us know that? But anyhow, that's that's a good looking sofa. Look at the slat work on the bottom. It's almost a shame to cover it, but I know he has to. So I probably, I, I hope that he could take my recommendations. So that's good. Okay, well Daniel has a question. Yes. Uh, Daniel asks, is it a big difference in burlap thickness, jute sheets, or is it a doesn't matter situation? That doesn't matter to me. The thickness of burlap, is he asking? Sorry, can you read it again? Uh, is it a big difference in burlap thickness, jute sheets, or is it a doesn't matter situation? I know that they have uh, different weights on the on the burlap. I never paid attention to that. I, I don't think it makes a difference in other words. A good question, but they do have different weights. All right, Patrick, you should know that after you, you yeah. went through those Especially things. with shipping, I uh, you know, figured that out with shipping. Well, it doesn't usually affect shipping, but it's it's more of an application for, for pulses. I'm not sure if I have any pull up to show you, but I don't think it matters. No. As long as it's burlap, and like what I mentioned before, uh, don't use the replacement nylon. They have a nylon, I don't know if they call it nylon burlap, which is kind of crazy. They just It's a replacement for burlap, and it's nylon. Don't use that. Two major reasons: it squeaks, and the second one, it really disintegrates. You'd be surprised for nylon how fast that disintegrates. Same thing with the webbing, and it, stre it, it, it doesn't stretch the webbing, and that's a problem. Uh, nylon webbing, but not stretching. And the quality that Jute has is that you know, we, if you notice that if you go onto our BroadwayPolsterySchool.com site, I don't even sell the nylon webbing or the nylon burlap replacement or things like that. Or I don't sell the nylon twine for springtime because I know none of it works. I mean, I've seen, and, and I'm not saying this to pick on manufacturers, although it might sound like that, high-end manufacturers, I won't, I won't tell you the brand name, I mean really expensive furniture, where they went to the, they're going to the nylon stuff, and after a 10 years, the, I open it up. It, yes, it's eight-way tied, but all the those, all those knots have slipped off the spring and when that happens, the spring starts to go like this, and it starts to go through the nylon replacement that they use instead of the burlap, see? And, and the reason that happens, because they use nylon webbing on the bottom, which doesn't, which doesn't uh, collapse, which doesn't over time gently stretch so that the springs go down instead of up. Does that make any sense to you guys? I have another question. This is from Madeline. Hey, Madeline. What about duck cloth instead of burlap for covering springs? <coughs> duck cloth is a little too much of a woven. I know people use it, um, but burlap has that quality that it, it, it kind of, it, look at my, actually, hold on. This is spring. The burlap tends to mesh better with the spring, right? It works, it plays with the spring as you sit down. The burlap being too stiff doesn't play as well, so, so it, it, it's a comfort thing, I think. So what you have to keep in mind that it's a time-tested coil spring, ruby twine, which is a jute twine with that coat that I talked about that's over it that prevents it from squeaking and slipping burlap over that. If you look at burlap and you put it up against the light, it's very porous opposed to the duck cloth. But that works really nicely. And then um, batting is a whole other thing. But those components are time-tested. And the jute 
uh, webbing underneath to hold the spring, anchor the spring in. That's been proven. Um, you know, in that 1860s chair that we did on YouTube, that's how, that's how they had it in 1860. Can you imagine? So how many years is that, Patrick? That's almost 150 years, 100, yeah, mm -hmm. 160 years of, and I believe, I can't recall all the YouTube videos that we did. I'll have to look at that to see. That might have been the original that we took out there, Patrick, you know? Crazy. So that's was. crazy. Yeah. It, it, it's a great system. Anyhow, good questions, you guys, though. So when you start, we talked about it last week, you, you, you're, you're a French baker. A French cook and find French five star French restaurant, and you're doing your favorite dish. And one day you just decide to leave out a little pepper or what, salt or whatever, and people notice. They they say, "What's wrong with the, you know?" It's just that you change things. It does. It's like we talked about those cushions, those custom cushions, especially the spring and down cushions. You know, and I was thinking a little bit about this today that we're going to be doing these videos, Patrick. We need to do this because. Yeah. We have a list of them now. We have a lot of ideas. We have a lot from you guys, a lot of ideas. People, I, I, I've watched YouTube videos about how to make your own spring and cotton cushion. Forget about it, you guys, really. Uh, it's, it's, you need the machinery. That's another thing I didn't mention, did I? Uh, not only do you need all of the materials, the proper materials, and I think I went over how, how they make a cushion like that, but you need the machinery in order to tighten it up. Does that make sense? And there's special machines. These machines are uh, very expensive um, and what it what it does is it contains the unit it contains you're doing a lot of things in a small area so what it does is with the machine that works it, it's a top stitching machine that's very expensive and the, the, it's fed in into the machine it tightens up the, the the unit so that it makes it easy to slip into a cushion into a fixed cushion does that make sense hold on one second um, I wonder if I have a cushion to show you. I've got to take this cushion apart. I hope it has a zipper now that I committed to this. Yes, it does. I was lucky. So I'm not sure what this is. This is a cushion that came into me. This is a high-end manufacturer, and I'm just curious about what they have in hand. Let's just take this apart. Ooh, we're lucky because it has a label. I'm going to take this right up. This was a brand new custom made, very high-end manufacturer. I won't mention the manufacturer. So we're going to see what they use in the cushion. And I'm so I'm going to have to guess at this because it's not, it doesn't tell me. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to examine this. I can't take it apart because we're reusing this because it's brand new. Well, th this is <laughs> this is just luck, you guys, that I have this in here. This is a beautiful cushion. This this I'm so happy to see this that a manufacturer has used something like this. So it's just what I was talking about. Um, so what you're seeing on the outer layer is is a I don't know if you can see this seam work here. The seams running through here, a beveling. Each, it's a pocket. There are three pockets here. There are three pockets here of 50% down, 50% feather. Okay, if I turn this sideways, you're going to see that, that that's over what's the core. Okay, and you see this? This is one of the keys. This is why even I wouldn't attempt a cushion like this in the shop because the stitching that you need you need a special machine to stitch this tight. You can't have this cover loose. Um, you see how beautifully finished this is? Um, and now on the inside, they have a beautiful, I can tell it's a Marshall unit. It's a Marshall unit with, uh, with foam on the outside, with just a really thin layer of foam on the outside, uh, muslin. And then um, over that, um, like maybe a little more foam and then um, maybe cotton, um, but this, this is a premium seed, real premium, yeah, like that. So, so it's containing the cushion. It's one thing, you know, having a Marshall unit and then putting cotton around it and then kind of with your hands trying to squeeze it and then making a muslin cover and fitting it in. Um, it really was, you're trying to do a lot within a certain, um, certain area. That's, that's the problem. 
pulling it off. Um, it, I've never seen, a, a, and I've tried them, I just don't like them as much as the good, good ones that are manufactured. And, and I think there's only, I'm going to say, I'm going to admit this, I'm going to tell you guys, I think there's only one manufacturer in the whole world that makes a cushion that's perfect. Okay, a perfect cushion. We do have the we do have them available on our website. You should check it out. They're expensive, but they're worth it. Um, so let's get back to these questions on YouTube. Uh, Janine, she says, uh, do-it-yourself upholstery eight-way tie. So that is our, our most watched video, right, Pat? The first video, pretty sure. Almost the was it the very first? I think so. Yeah. Wow. So that very first video, we, we were thinking at one time taking some of the old, you know, sloppier ones that were done by those old iPhones. Save right? us every, every Q&A. But everybody <laughs> They're not says, going anywhere. <laughs> Patrick says they're not going anywhere. I mean, if we, you know, we, you know, I admit, we we were doing some goofy videos. Patrick was younger, right, Patrick? A little bit younger. And um, I was too. We're a little bit, both of us were a little bit more immature, right, Patrick? No, I'm still immature. So we were doing funny ones too. I think one time I had a, is that one still up with all the cushions that are piled up and then I forget. And then, and then I, you know, you pulled a cord on me and they all fell on me or something. Yeah, it was like a, a well, I don't know, a cold cartoon. <laughs> a coyote or something. You know, why not? We were having fun and we never in our wildest dreams when we were doing those early ones, right Patrick? Yeah. Thought that we would have 10,000 subscribers but we started, I think part of our success, right, Patrick, is that we started to get a little bit more serious. Oh, people like the funny stuff, too. I think we're just, you know, putting a lot of content out there, so it's good. The content, I got, I think, got a little bit more in-depth, right? Yeah. But that eight-way tie was an honest video. That was an honest first video, for sure, because people it like it. a good production, but it's yeah. still good. <laughs> yeah. And Janine says, just watch this again as a refresher. Thanks, Kevin. There you go. Thank you. And again, so then we have, uh, this is from Skeptic, and it's about the Chippendale Restoration Update Number 2 Horsehair. Horsehair, why not throw a couple of birds in this while you're at it? <laughs> That's pretty funny, isn't it, Patrick? Yeah, I saw that. It's being a wise guy, right? Yeah, but he's, I think it's tongue-in-cheek. It's not, he says, just kidding, but yeah. I threw them in the trash since I don't know where my old coach was. My old couch was kept. Later, I learned this was almost sacrilegious what I did. Actually, it brings up a good point. This sofa that we're doing, uh, Patrick, that restoration one. We know the history of that sofa. Right. We know that it was a one-own a sofa, and we knew it was in a house, and it was pretty much with the fabric that was on there. It was encased. It's like almost having a cryovac for, for 90 years. So of course we took the old fabric, we're going to take the old fabric off and do some refurbishing underneath. Uh, you guys will get to see this soon, right Patrick? Yeah. Um, but if you don't know the history of a piece, I can see why you, you, you'd have to, if, you, if you're willing to put the work into it, um, take it down to the frame, I would, yeah. I mean, you don't know the history. You have to know the history of a piece of furniture, I think, if you're going to do what we call a reupholstering. You know, the difference between a reupholstering and a restoration, right? Reupholstering is taking the old cover off, sprucing it up, tying a spring here and there, putting a new layer of cotton on, and then upholstering it. Restoration is taking it to the frame and rebuilding with all new materials. You can imagine, it's three times longer the work, so you have to charge a, a professional, you have to charge appropriately enough, you have to know your hourly, you know, what you're worth hourly and add up all your hours. And usually people aren't willing to pay for that. Honestly, they're, they're, it's a lot of money to do that. So, Janine asks on the same video, Chippendale Restoration Update number two, she says, looking good, just wondering about the use of the white twine you use for tying the springs. I thought the best ruby twine from Italy, that looked like tufted twine almost. I, I'm a, am I just confused? Also only a four-way tie for back springs. Yeah, you know, the back springs are a lighter gauge. The back springs, um, they have to be softer. So believe it or not, if you're using the ruby twine on the back springs, it's, it's a harder treatment. So, so you're looking for 
something that's soft, a softer treatment, and they're not necessarily four-way, eight-way tied on the back. Isn't that interesting? So the nylon twine is sufficient enough, and you wouldn't believe uh, we just actually did another segment of this today, so it's a, it's a good, a timely question. How wonderful that came out with the horsehair. We restored that, put the horsehair back and everything, and now the fabric's on it. It really feels good. And that will last a, a good long time because when you look at the use, you know, when you look at the seat takes most of the weight. So if you're 200 pounds, 200 pounds is, is put on the spring. So you definitely need the, the ruby twine and eight way tie. On the back, you can imagine when you lean back, that's probably about, I would, I would guess maybe. I don't know, 30 pounds, 30 pounds of, if that, of pressure, um, and, and it doesn't require the work that the seat does. Now, oftentimes, they don't even put springs in the back for that reason, I guess. But anyhow, those are good questions. How much time do we have left, Patrick, or is there any more live questions right now? Madeline just posted a funny comment. I mean, <laughs> Madeline says, great, I, I just broke half my fingers doing eight-way ties on my nine-foot sofa when I only had to do four. Is she talking about the back or the seat? Because it's, it's, so we, we talked about a, a chair that had a drop-in unit that only needed a four-way tie on the seat. And then we talked about the back springs that only needed a four-way tie with the lighter twine. So if, if she had a sofa that that was the loose cush like the loose spring work like this, right? She did need to do an eight way tie. But it's tough work, isn't it? I mean I have calluses on top of calluses, you know, and, and um, you have to get used to that work for sure. You can see how she broke nails doing it. That was a major complaint among amongst uh, my, some of my that students. That was the back. Was it the back? Oh yeah, she didn't have to eight way tie it. All right. So, I think, uh, let me just check out the time. Oh, it's four o'clock, Patrick. Wow. We Not did, a, one. We did week. an hour. We, well, I think we changed it again to three o'clock, right, Patrick? Was it at 3.30 last week? Ah, uh, I forgot. That's by my fault. But. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoy doing these questions and answers. I have to, uh, if you notice, my, my energy level was down this week uh, compared to last week, right, Patrick? Yeah, last week you were going ballistic. Well, there. last week it was a three cappuccino day, I think. But this week was only two, so uh, we're going to have to re-examine that. Right, Pat? I guess. I'm going to be a whole uh, case limit here for you. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again for, for checking us out. And don't forget uh, to, to go on the YouTube channel, the, our channel at Broadway Upholstery School on the YouTube. And our uh, website's uh, broadwayupholsteryschool.com. And uh, if you're local, um, it's Upholstery on Broadway is where I do most of my work. <coughs> and uh, I think that's it. I think also we won't forget that we sell fabrics through uh, Fabrics on Broadway. And you can reach, reach us, uh, just Google us, and you'll see our web pages. Right, Pat? Yeah, you got it all right. All right, so I think that's it. We'll see you next time. See you guys.